to begin with the introductory part, now the period following the suppression of the Taiping Rebellion is known as the Westernizing Movement. Westernizing movement means learning from the West, and this learning from the West uh, essentially means gaining knowledge about Western firearms and to establish a Chinese army, well equipped modern Chinese army. The Manchu government will be able to suppress rebellions, internal rebellions, in different parts of the country. And this phase partly coincided with what is also known as the Tumchi Restoration and the self strengthening movement, which covers a period from 1860 to 1895. That would be followed by the reform movement of 1898, which was a bourgeois reformist movement that sought to make a break with the old Confucian learning and learn from the West. Now, during the last stage of the Taiping Rebellion, the Manchu uh, ruling clique were in possession of Western firearms, and it was only with those Western firearms that they were able to suppress rebellions in different parts of the country. Not just the Taiping Rebellion, but a number of other rebellions which coincided and also followed the rebellion in other parts. The Manchu rulers realized that they should not only learn how to use Western firearms, artillery, steamships, etc., but they should know how to make those things. That was very important for them because they felt that it was possible for the Western powers to score victories over China because they were in possession of these things, these modern weapons of different types. The expression Tung Chi restoration comes from the name of the emperor, Tung Chi, 1862 to 1874. It has been pointed out by Emmanuel Su in his book, The Rise of Modern China. There shouldn't be any comparison between the Tung Chi restoration and the Meiji restoration, as has been done by some scholars belonging to different countries. Tung Chi was a minor when he sat on the throne. And so the political power in China was controlled by the Empress Dozer, Zhu Xi, and her control over the political affairs of the state remained till her death in 1908. Westernizing movement and self-strengthening reforms, these were, these were interrelated things. The doctrine of learning foreign matters constituted in some ways the basis, the theoretical basis, for the imperial policy of self-strengthening. And it was a policy which was set in motion after the end of the Second Opium War in 1860 and continued till the outbreak of the Sino-Japanese War of 1894-95. And its main purpose was to strengthen the military and the bureaucratic apparatus of the Qing or the Manchu state. The most ardent advocate of the policy of learning from the West was a person called Wei Yuan. He was well known as a scholar, writer, and politician. He wrote a number of works, and the most important of all his works was his encyclopedic work on the geography of foreign lands. He made it clear that the main purpose of it was to use barbarians to control barbarians. And he urged the adoption of Western techniques and recommended, at the same time, the construction of an arsenal and shipyards in Kwangtung with the help of foreign technicians, gunnery instructors, and his proposals also included another thing, that was the founding of an office to translate barbarian books, that is foreign books, in order to learn from the West. Another person to advocate the same doctrine, doctrine of adopting Western uh, technical and military education, was Feng Guifen. It was important because Confucian ethics needed to be warmed up and to reinvigorate the ideology of Confucius, he advised restoring ancient institutions to the village elders, which implied that the Chinese landlords should have greater powers in handling rural affairs. In 1862, we have another scholar in Zhao Wong by name. He presented a memorial to the Manchu ruling court. Like Feng, he was also an opponent of the Taipings. He took part in the suppression of the Taiping Rebellion and recommended a policy of self-strengthening. 
After the end of the Second Opium War and the signing of the treaties of Tianjin and Peking, Britain and France started imposing uh, one term after another to extract more and more privileges from the Manchu government. It means that the country was further opened uh, to foreign penetration. Now, both the Manchus and the foreigners wanted to develop mutual understanding because the Manchus had already succumbed to the foreign powers. Their ties became stronger in the days to come. And both of them agreed that China should adopt Western military technology that would help China, the Chinese government, to establish her control over all parts of the country and particularly to suppress rebellions that had developed, that had been growing uh, in many parts of the country during that period. Now, as a matter of fact, the self-strengthening was an essential part of the state policy during that period. And it served as an instrument for the enhancement of state power. The ruling classes made it very clear through their propaganda that the main aim of this policy was to put an end to internal turmoil, to bring about law and order in all parts of the country. And actually their main target was the rebel peasant. Because peasant rebellions constituted one of the most important features of the history of feudal China. One of the important features of the, this self-strengthening movement was to set up arsenals, set up factories, to set up shipyards, uh, gunpowder and munition, munition factories, to buttress the feudal forces with guns, rifles and warships. And besides constructing modern factories, the advocates of the self-strengthening also paid attention to consolidating the Confucian system of education in public and private schools and to alter practically nothing in that system. No change. And as before, it wanted to train young men for civil service examinations, which enabled them to get access to the uh, bureaucratic hierarchy. For setting up munitions factories, for setting up textile factories, coal mines, railroads, and telecommunication network, China had to depend almost totally on Western foreign experts and also on foreign missionary. They had to borrow the services of foreign experts. They had to uh, import machines from abroad. And as a result, they had to pay a huge amount of money for buying machines from the Western countries and to pay salaries. And the amount of salary was unbelievable. One chief engineer received, besides his other stipends, an annual salary of 96,000 gold coins, which for a chief engineer received for his services. This period that quite naturally was also the period of the emergence of the Chinese big bourgeoisie. So we have the emergence of a new social class in China, industrial bourgeoisie, and along with the industrial bourgeoisie, we have also the emergence of the Chinese working class. So these two new social classes appeared in China in the second half of the 19th century. In the year 1898, there occurred in China a major political event that came to be known as a reform movement of 1898. Essentially, it was a bourgeois reformist trend that developed in China. And this bourgeois reformist trend originated from above. And it took place at a time when the contradictions within China, particularly between feudalism and the broad masses of the Chinese people, that was one fundamental contradiction. Apart from this contradiction, there was another contradiction. There is a contradiction between imperialist powers and the Chinese nation as a whole. So all these contradictions became sharper than ever before. As a result of the intensification of these contradictions, uh, divisions appeared within the Manchu court. From the beginning of the war against Japan, it was 1894-95. 
from that period, Manchu court was totally divided about what should be our uh, course of action. And as was the case in the earlier wars with the Western powers, in this case also, during the war against Japan, uh, one defeat followed another. And a strong minority emerged among the high officials led by Wang and Zhang, they were two important officials of the time, who wanted to fight to the end, to fight the Japanese to the end. And they, they represented what came to be known as a war party. They were pro-war against Japan. Their stand aroused strong sympathies uh, among some of the provincial officials, uh, scholars and merchants of the big towns. As for example, Cantonese merchants, they formed a committee which included 72 guilds and corporations of the town and it was this committee which collected funds to meet the expenditure of the war. And the war party consisted of people with varied aims. On the one hand, it comprised of staunch conservatives. And for the staunch conservatives, driving back Japan meant driving back change. They were against the change, so they were against the Japanese. That was their stand. On the other hand, we have a new generation of younger people for whom resistance represented the starting point of a new order. These younger men, belonging to the new generation with new ideas, they started to win over some of their elders. Among them, Wing. Wing was one. And in fact, for several years, Wing had been the moving spirit of a group of officials and scholars who wanted to oust the Empress Dowager Zhu Si, who was the Emperor's aunt, incidentally, so that the Emperor Kuang Su, Kuang Su was the Emperor at that time, uh, could lead the renovation of the country in the proper way. So you said that some historians have compared the Meiji Restoration in Japan and the Tungchi Restoration in China. What are the basic points of this uh, comparison? The scholars who uh, made a comparison between the two restorations uh, they possibly had in their mind that both were restorations. But apart from this, uh, there was hardly any similarity between the two. Because uh, in the case of Japan, major restoration of 1868, it was very much anti-feudal and very much pro-capitalist. It was anti-shogun, anti-daimyo, and that was a period when capitalism had already made their emergence in Japan. So Meiji Restoration coincided with the coming of new social forces to power. Yes, Emperor Meiji, he, he was there in the forefront. And of course, he represented the old society. But actually, the Meiji Restoration signified the end, the doom of the old society and the beginning of the new one. So that is one thing. That is all about Meiji Restoration. Now, Tungchi Restoration had... Uh, nothing in common with it because the Chinese society was still a feudal society. Uh, industrial capitalism that developed in China could develop only because of the coming of the Western powers and as in our country, India, industrial capitalism was transplanted on the Chinese soil by the foreign powers. So, Tung Chi was Tungchi was not like the Japanese emperor. Chinese emperor was very much a feudal in character and Manchu government was feudal in character, which succumbed to Western pressure, Western capitalist pressure or imperialist pressure. And so there could be hardly any comparison between the, between the two restorations, except that both were restoration. It was against this background of the self-strengthening movement that a large number of scholars, 1,300 scholars, sent a memorial to the emperor, Kuang Su, in May 1895. And this memorial was written by Kang Yu Wei, who was the, the most important leader of the reform movement of 1898. In the memorial, 
demands were placed for many things. One was that the Treaty of Shimonoseki should not be ratified by the government of China, that those responsible for it should be replaced, that the Chinese army should be reorganized, and that numerous reforms should be undertaken. And this included reforms over a variety of areas, over many areas, such as finance, banking, postal system. Demand was placed to the government for giving encouragement to private industry and commerce, for the study of agronomy, modern science and technical subjects, construction of more schools and libraries, changes in the examination system, that is old Confucian system of imperial examination should be changed. And the memorials of Kang Yu Wei were then circulated widely in the scholarly circles. Reformist ideas were also spread by the press. Press played an important role in this. Media or the press expanded considerably in this period. 25 important journals began publication between 1896 and 1898. Of those journals, the most important were Current Events Gazette and National News. It was particularly mainly these two journals which served to unite, to knit together the various groups of reformers uh, scattered uh, throughout the provinces. Now, an important aspect of the reformist movement was the way it spread geographically. The most active centers were in the regions of the lower Yangtze region, uh, Kiangsu, Kiangsi, and Chile region. Then we have Hunan also, which was another center of reformist activities. And there were various reasons for their participation. Many people participated from different reasons. Reform movement was thus spreading throughout the provinces. Demands for reform were placed, had already been placed through the memorial, which was signed by 1,300 scholars from many parts of the country. And when this movement has been spreading, a few thinkers started to remold the ideology of the movement. And the most prominent of them, as I have pointed out, was Kang Yu Wei. He was born in a landlord bureaucrat family in the Guangdong province of China, and he was schooled in the Confucian way. And he set forth his interpretation of the reforms in, in two major works. One was a study of classics, and the other was Confucius as a reformer. Kang arrived at a view of human history as a progression composed of three ages. First, there was the age of disorder. Second, the age of approaching peace, which is characterized by small tranquility. And the third was the age of great peace or the typing. And third age, great unity is achieved. And in the last phase, all inequality is abolished. All social inequality is abolished. Governments disappear and men live in fellowship, happiness, and harmony. That was the idea of Kang Yu Wei. Now, Kang Yu Wei's writings had exercised considerable influence on the intellectual evolution of modern China. Mao Zedong explicitly referred to Kang's utopia in describing the future communist society. The French historian Cheno says that Kang's enduring contribution lies primarily in his use of the principles to reinterpret Confucianism in such a way that it could act as a theoretical basis for political reform. There were differences of opinion among the reformers, no doubt about it. But they were united in their opposition to the conservatives. The result was a common program of reform which slowly took shape through their writings and which embraced such, such fields as philosophy, politics, education, and economics. The conservatives held 
that the established order was the will of heaven and like heaven unalterable. It is permanent, something permanent. Established order is permanent. It will never change. The reformers, on the other hand, uh, proposed a different notion, the notion of evolution and constant progress. Ideas which were virtually unknown to Chinese thought, at least dominant Chinese thought, of course. Conservatives were the defenders of absolute monarchy and the sacred power of the sovereign. The reformers, on the other hand, did not really advocate democracy, but they favored a constitutional monarchy. Not absolute monarchy, but constitutional monarchy, in which and there would be an enlightened elite would share power by means of a national parliament and local assemblies. So one view is a view of absolute monarchy, and the other view is the view of constitutional monarchy, which will be based on a national parliament and local assemblies, and where uh, intellectuals, intellectual elite, would have a role to play, major role to play. And to encourage the elite and strengthen the national power, the reformers aimed at encouraging agriculture, industry, and trade. And they wanted to have schools where political and social doctrines would be taught and where science subjects would be given emphasis. The diversity of opinions within the reformers was a reflection of his composite social makeup. In fact, it was a period when everything was changing. The traditional elite had started to change. The merchant became involved in politics. The official began to invest in industry and trade as well as in land. And rural scholar wanted to become an urban intellectual. But the old regime still dominated Chinese life. For each individual was entangled in a network of family, personal, and professional relationships. So we have the we have the coexistence of new ideas and the old ideas in the Chinese society among the intellectuals in Italy. That was that formed the intellectual milieu of China at that time. Now in April 1898, the Association for National Defense was founded which actually acted as the embryo of a political party. On 11 June 1898, the emperor issued an edict, and through the edict, he announced his decisions on national affairs. This marked the beginning of the attempt at reform, known as the 100 Days of Reform, or the Reform Movement of 1898. Actually, it continued for 103 days, from 11 June to 16 September 1898. And between June and September 1898, a large number of edicts came out, and these dealt with reform of the administration, education and economy, large numbers of useless offices and posts were eliminated, subsidies paid to all Manchus were abolished, and all officials and subjects were allowed to address suggestions directly to the emperor. The old academics, as well as temples which had fallen into disuse, were to be transformed into schools. Peking University was founded at that time. Science and politics were taught in schools and universities and were to be included in the subjects of examination. Plans were also made for preparing a budget. So far, during the 100 days, the Empress Zhu Xi had given a free hand to the emperor in order to avert an explosion of anti-Manchu feeling. But now she had the emperor imprisoned. Kuang Su was imprisoned by his aunt, Empress Zhu Xi, and all the reformist leaders were executed. All the reform movements were revoked by the empress, except for the edict founding the University of Peking. So it, it was in this way that the reform movement came to an end. It was a short-lived affair and it proved that it would be very difficult for the Chinese people to uh, bring about change through reforms. So the only alternative left at that time 
was an alternative of, a, of the revolutionary overthrow of the existing regime. And that was a task which was left to the Chinese people who were to be led by Sun Yat-sen. Please explain the age-old idea of everything unalterable. That idea should be traced back to the Chu period, which came after the Shang dynasty in China. It was a slave society at that time, and Chu rulers, they developed the idea that all things on earth, heaven, earth, and human beings, these are controlled by nature, these are controlled by heaven, and that all things are permanent. There are laws which are permanent. And so since the Chu rulers had come to rule over China by the mandate of heaven, they received the mandate of heaven, they received the mandate from the Lord on high. And so they would continue to rule. And those laws, these were unalterable, permanent laws. That is an old concept which prevailed, which, which continued. And Confucian concept was also talked about return to the Chu rights when feudal forces had been emerging. Feudal forces talked about change. And so Confucius talked about return to the rights, return to the Chu rights. So these laws were unalterable according to the Chinese government, Chinese state, or the rulers who ruled over China for centuries together. In the period after the Taiping Rebellion, uh, the Manchu government felt the need to strengthen themselves and to strengthen themselves they needed western firearms and they also needed the knowledge of how to manufacture modern firearms in order to set up an army to quell disturbances internal disturbances meaning rebel peasants of course another important development was the emergence of new social classes chinese bourgeoisie and the chinese working class along with the introduction of industrial capitalism in china which was a transplantation on the Chinese on the Chinese soil and not the product of the evolution of the Chinese society. And that was followed by the reform movement of 1898, which was a movement from above and which was anti-Confucian in character. But this movement also failed, like the peasant movements in the earlier period. And uh, so the people now turned towards revolutionary change, which was to be done and in which Sun Yat-sen was to play and a major role.